Good afternoon, my friends. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Arthur Brooks, and as you heard, I'm the president of the American Enterprise Institute, which is a think tank like this, but in Washington, D.C. We've been around for 80 years. I'm not the first president, obviously. Um, I've been the president for 10 years of AEI. Now, in some of you have, how many of you have been to the United States? How many of you have visited Washington, D.C.? Okay, some of you, a few of you. We have a question that people always ask in the United States when they meet you for the first time. They say, what do you do? And by that they mean, what's your job? Now, this is important for your identity in a capitalist economy. It says a lot about you, what your job is. So everybody has an answer to the question, what do you do? I'm a think tank president. Sadan, he's a journalist. The problem is that we never ask each other why we do what we do. Most people don't know the answer to that question. So if somebody asked you, why do you do what you do for a living, what would be your answer? Would you have a, a practical answer? It was, but I, my, my parents told me to go to university and study this, and that it was the only thing I knew how to do. Maybe. Would you have a moral answer to your question? What is the, the reason that you're doing it from, a, from a, a service perspective to other people? I think it's important to have an answer to that question, no matter what your job is. That's the moral point of our work, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. I'm an economist by training. And I'm going to tell you why I'm an economist. I'm not going to tell you what I study, because everybody knows what economists study. We study money. <laughs> we study the economy. I'm going to tell you why I'm an economist. And, and it's a story that goes back uh, a long time. I didn't, I didn't study economics initially. I was a musician. I started my life as a, as a classical musician, a French horn player. I was a, I, in my 20s, I was in the Barcelona Symphony Orchestra in Barcelona, Spain. And during that time, I enjoyed being a musician because everybody likes being a musician. But I asked myself, why do I do this? What's the purpose? What's the moral purpose of what I'm doing? Now, I had a, a composer, a favorite composer, somebody who wrote music that I admired more than anybody else. And if you know anything about Western classical music, you've heard of the composer Johann Sebastian Bach. He's one of the most famous composers who ever lived. Now, I admired him because he was my favorite composer. He was the greatest composer who ever lived. He, he was also productive. He wrote a thousand, he published a thousand pieces of music. He also had 20 children, which I think is a special kind of productivity. He was a, a, amazing. And, and Bach was asked near the end of his life, why do you write music? And here was his answer. He said, the aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glorification of God and the refreshment of the soul. And I heard that and I said, I want to give that answer with my work. I want to give the same answer. When somebody asks me, what do you do and why do you do it? I want to say, my work is for the glorification of God and the refreshment of the soul. But I didn't feel like I could say that as a musician. So I started looking for something else to do. When, the, when I was in my 20s, I was 28 years old, and I started looking for something else that would serve other people more. It would glorify God and it would serve other people. I started studying a lot of different things, as a matter of fact. It's one of the nice things in the United States is you can change fields. People change their jobs an awful lot. They go back to school and they reinvent their lives. And I learned something when I was studying in my late 20s that I never knew before. See, I come from a family that's leftist. I, I come from a, a city in the United States that's the most left-wing place in the United States. It's a city called Seattle. It's on the Pacific Ocean. And my father is a professor, and my mother is an artist. So we're very left-wing. Nobody ever had any respect for capitalism. But I learned something when I was studying economics in my late 20s that really changed my life. I learned that the world is getting less poor than it used to be. I learned something amazing to me, 
which is that the percentage of the world's population living on a dollar a day or less, that's starvation level worldwide, absolute poverty, corrected for inflation, that that percentage, since I was a child, had fallen by 80%. I didn't know this. Most people don't know this. 70% of Americans believe that poverty has gotten worse since 1970. That's completely wrong. It's 80% better than when I was a child. This country has changed fundamentally. The first time I, you know this better than I do, of course, I visited India the first time when I was 19 years old in 1983. And now when I come today, it's like a different world. It's so encouraging. It's not rich enough, of course, but it's a better place than it used to be. So I set out to ask, answer the question, why is the world getting better? Why is the world getting richer? Why are fewer people dying of starvation? Why is there more prosperity? And I found the answer. It's not political. No politics at all. It doesn't matter if you're a leftist or a rightist. We know, all economists know, that five things lowered poverty by 80% since I was a child. Globalization. The world has gotten more connected. We're sharing ideas. We're sharing goods and services. We're sending people all over the world. Free trade. Free trade has completely changed economies and made it possible for us to touch each other in new ways. After globalization and free trade are property rights, property rights are now almost universal in, 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 in economies that are, are growing and developing. The rule of law, the rule of law is spreading around the world. And finally, a culture of entrepreneurship. A culture in which we, we want people to prosper, we want people to do new things, we want people to start businesses. This is spread around the world. These five things. These are the reasons that people are less poor than they were. And that's what I learned in my late 20s. I thought to myself, if I spread that message, then we can maybe pull the next 2 billion people out of poverty. See. 80% reduction means 2 billion people who are not starving today. And these are my brothers and sisters. I want the next 2 billion and the next 2 billion after that. And the way that we get it is with democratic capitalism. That, my friends, is the moral case for capitalism. Now, I don't think capitalism is perfect. I think it has a lot of problems, as a matter of fact. And so I think that we need we need to, to root it in basic human morality of brotherhood and solidarity. I also think that we need governments that can regulate things properly. But, because nothing's perfect. But for the first time in my life, I was able to find a system and dedicate myself to do something like Bach, to glorify God and to serve my fellow man by working in a particular profession. That's why I'm an economist. It has nothing to do with money, and nothing to do with taxes, and nothing to do with government. It has everything to do with trying to make fewer poor people and give people a better chance in life. Because I've seen it happen with my own eyes. Now, I think everybody should be fighting for this. I, I think that everybody on the left and everybody on the right, we should come together around democratic capitalism. But there's a problem. When I talk about this sometimes in the United States and in Europe and in Asia, sometimes people will say, I understand this. I understand that it's a good thing, but, but I'm not sure that it actually is good for the soul. What do you mean? Well, if you're just talking about working and working and earning and earning and prosperity, it sounds like materialism. And materialism is bad for the soul. So how do I square these two things? Even my own children tell me this. Huh. And you know, there's a, a, a research study that I found very interesting that I saw from a university in New York called Rochester, University of Rochester. And at this university, they, they looked at two groups of people. They're 22 years old. There were 150 people in each group. One group of people said that the most important thing to them were money goals of getting rich, of being prosperous, of being more successful than others. 
The other group of 22 said the most important goals were people and love and relationships. They followed up with these, with these two groups five years later. And what did they find? The people who cared most about money, they had a lot of anxiety and a lot of anger. They had a lot of uh, mental problems and physical problems. The people who said they cared more about love and relationships, they had more peace in their lives and more happiness in their lives and more satisfying lives. And so this makes me think that there's a problem. I understand that capitalism is good for the poor. I understand that. But here's my question. Is it good for me? Is it good for you? I was trying to find the answer to this question because, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? I want to do something that, that, that eliminates poverty, but I also want something that makes people happy because happiness is the most important thing. I was puzzling about this, how to answer this question. Is capitalism good for the economy but bad for the soul? And while I was thinking about this, Sadhana and I, we were on a trip to India. This is several years ago now. This is in 2014. And Sadhana took me to a wonderful place, a, a, a very special place in Delhi. It's a famous temple. It's called the Swami Narayanaksharam Temple. It's spectacular. It was built in 2006, and it took 10,000 stone-cutting artisans working full-time for seven years to build this temple. It's a wonder of the modern world. I went there as a tourist, but I met there. Sadhana introduced me to a Swami. He said, there's a Swami that I've scheduled you to meet to ask your question. The wise man. Ask him your question. Does capitalism destroy the soul? His name was Gyan Muni. So I went to Akshardam Temple, and I was waiting to meet Gyan Muni. And I was thinking in my head, how am I going to describe my problem? Because this is pretty American, and I know he's not American. I wonder if he'll, he'll get the subtlety. I wonder if he'll understand the details of what I'm saying. And I, and I saw him walking over to me. It was May, so it was hot in Delhi. And it was a bright, it was a bright uh, uh, shining day. It was at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And he was wearing an orange robe, and he had a shaved head. He's a swami. He's a monk. And he, he comes up and he's three meters away from me and he looks at me and he, he sees that I'm the guy who's here to see him. And he says, how are you doing? And he has an American accent. So I said, where are you from? And he said, Texas. This is a Swami from Texas. So I said, Swami, tell me your story. He said, well, he's Indian, but his parents were were uh, petroleum engineers, and they moved to Houston. He was born in Texas to an Indian immigrant family. Now, now you have to understand, some of you have been to the United States, some of you have family in the United States, I bet. Indian Americans are the single most uh, uh, successful immigrant group in American history. And that's saying a lot, because this is a country that has a lot of successful people in it. So. Indian Americans work really hard and they're really highly educated in my country. So one of, the, one of the secrets to Indian American success is that they push their kids like crazy. Their kids have to achieve more and work harder and go to school. And it's something I've always admired. So I'm talking to Gilan Moody and he tells me about his parents. He said his parents had goals for him that were very materially oriented. You're going to work hard and get good grades, and you're going to succeed, and you're going to get rich. His parents told him this again and again. And he made them very proud. He finished high school when he was 16, and he went to the University of Texas on a full scholarship. He finished in three years, and then he did his MBA in one year. This is amazing. He finishes, and he goes to become a consultant with a company called McKinsey. And he said that he... He came, in his first year, he was making more money than his father. And his father was very proud. And I said, that's wonderful. And he said, well, it was okay, but there were certain sacrifices. He said he never saw his family. He didn't have time to have a girlfriend. He said that he, he really didn't have any fun because he worked 100 hours a week. He did this for a long time, he did this for five years, and he woke up on his 26th birthday, 
And he said, is this it? Is this my life? Am I going to work the rest of my life and never have any relationships and never have any love? Mm -hmm. So he, he set a goal <coughs> that every day, he was a very pious Hindu, he said he was going to pray about it every day for six months and then make a decision about what to do. And so he did. And six months later, he had a decision. He quit his job, he sold everything he had, he came back to India, went to a seminary, and uh, five years later emerged a Hindu monk. And that's how he wound up at the Swami Narayan Aksharam Temple. Now, he's now about my age, so this was a long time ago that he did this, and now he's a senior monk at this temple. And, and, and so, here's the problem. I told you this story, but here's the problem. I have come to ask him if capitalism is good. You know what he's going to say. He's going to say, I, I'm thinking in my head, I'm going to say, Swami, is capitalism good? And he's going to say, it's a man-made prison. I know he's going to say this, but I ask anyway. Swami, is capitalism good? And Swami says, no, it's great. It's the only thing that has pulled the people of my country out of poverty in its history. And I said, but look at you, Swami. You've given up everything. You don't even have one penny. You have no possessions. You're completely poor. And he said, you don't understand. The problem isn't money. I said, what is it? He said, it's attachment to money. He taught me a Sanskrit word that day. Maybe you know it. Upadana which means the sticky attachment, the sticky craving for inadequate things. He also reminded me that there's a scripture in my religion. I'm a Catholic. It's the most single important thing in my life. I prob you probably understood that from the beginning of my talk because I want to glorify God. The most misunderstood verse for Catholics, some of you are Catholics, is in 1 Timothy where St. Paul, what we always hear is St. Paul says that money is the root of all evil. That's not what he says. Here's what the Spirit, here's, here's what the verse says. The love of money is the root of all evil. The problem, my friends, is not capitalism. It's attachment to material things. I had to understand that by coming to your country to understand the problem in, in my country. So why do we make this mistake again and again? Why do we do this? And I think there's a conspiracy. I think that the world teaches us that there's a formula for happiness. If you look at Hollywood movies or Bollywood movies or commercials on television, if you talk to people on the street, here's the formula for happiness. Love things, use people, Worship yourself. But that's the wrong formula. Here's the right formula. Use things, love people, worship God. Simple formula, but the world turns it inside out. So how do we do that? How can we pursue democratic capitalism and not lose our souls? And the answer is that we need a, a practical set of guide of, 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 of techniques, of tricks to make it happen in our life. And I want to offer you two ideas. Two ideas on how we can live abundance without attachment in our lives. There are two practices. Here's the first practice. Think about the thing to which you're most attached and give it away. See, People tend to be attached, and you need to rebel. I need to rebel against my attached nature. And the way to rebel, to be a rebel, to be a warrior against my nature, is to detach myself physically from the things to which I'm most attached. For years I have done research as an economist about charity, about giving away money and time. And I used to teach at a university in New York called Syracuse University. When I was teaching at Syracuse University, I was doing research on, on charity, and I found this funny thing that I never understood. I found that when people give money away, they get richer afterward. Give money away, get richer. It doesn't make sense. When you get your PhD in economics, 
you never learn that the way to get rich is to give all your money away. That doesn't make sense. So I never really believed what I was finding. I found it in my data, and I found it again and again and again. Why is that? Well, I was having lunch with a psychologist, and I told him about my research findings. He said, oh, that's an old finding in psychology. We've known that for decades. I said, really? Why? He said, oh, no. See, it, it, it's not that there's some cosmic hand of God. What happens is that you change your own mind and your own heart and your own brain and you become more effective and people like you better and you become happier and happier people make more money. <laughs> and he showed me some research on this and sure enough, I started finding things every place that showed this. Give your money away, a little bit at least, get richer. Give your money and time away, you'll be happier, you'll be healthier. I, there's one piece of research that I love that shows that if you give your money away, you get better looking. <laughs> I promise you it's true. It's at, the, it's at the University of Liverpool in England. Two researchers, they have an experiment where they bring people into the laboratory and, and they ask men to come in with their wives. Some of the guys have been married for six months and some have been married for 50 years. And they bring them into the laboratory and the first researcher, he, he goes to the husband and he gives him a bunch of coins. He puts it in his pocket. About, Ten, ten dollars in coins in his pocket. So a lot of, a lot of change, making a lot of noise. And he says, simple experiment. I want you to walk from this building to that building over there. Which points out a building. And when you get there, it's a short interview with my colleague. And then you get to keep the money and go home. Simple experiment. Okay. So each couple walks down a path. They leave the building. They're walking down a path. And there's an alleyway between the buildings. And when they get to the alleyway, a beggar comes walking out. It's part of the experiment. And the beggar comes up to the couple and he says to the man, do you have any money? He does, because the researcher put the money in his pocket. They know he does. And he has to make a decision. Do I give money to the beggar or not? How much? Makes the decision, they go to the next building and the other psychologist asks first to the husband, did you give money to the beggar? And then he asks the wife, how attractive do you find him right now? Why? Because the researchers wanted to know the connection between you giving to the beggar and your wife thinking that you're attractive. And sure enough, the more money you give away, the more your wife likes you. So this is a, a piece of advice for you men. Okay? Hmm. Bottom line, my friends, is this. Practice number one of abundance without attachment. Get into your mind the thing to which you're attached and give it away. Second, second practice, only invest in experiences, not things, with people you love. And remember the study I told you about where people who were investing only in money in their career, they had a lot of problems. But the people who were investing in relationships, they got happier and had better lives. Learn from this. Invest in experiences with people you love. I've been married for a long time, almost 30 years. And um, um, right after I got married, a long time ago, 20 plus years ago, a year after I get married, my wife and I, we were both very young, we were in our mid-20s, and we were having a big argument, huge argument. We were having an argument about how to celebrate our first wedding anniversary, which is kind of ironic that we would have an argument about that. But here's the reason that we were arguing about our first wedding anniversary. Um, we had no money. We were, I mean, we were living in a little tiny apartment. We didn't have any furniture. I had a job that didn't pay very much money. We had just come to the United States from Spain. My wife didn't speak any English. She had a, a, a really low paying job. It was a big problem. But we wanted to celebrate our wedding anniversary. And we had two ideas. So I'm a, I'm a thrifty, practical American. I wanted to celebrate our anniversary by buying a sofa very romantic. My wife wanted to celebrate our wedding anniversary by going to the beach, because she's from Spain, and they're all about the beach. Okay, but we didn't have enough money to do both. We had to choose, sofa or beach. And this was our argument. Sofa, beach, sofa, beach. So finally we compromised, and we went to the beach. <laughs> and that's why I'm still married. <laughs> But that's not my point. 
We talked about this a couple of years ago, and we remembered this. And we, re we realized something really important. We finally got a couch. I don't remember the couch. I don't, I kind of remember the color. But that was four couches ago. But I can tell you everything about that weekend to the beach. Every hour. Everything we did. Why? Because we were in love. And we still are. Hmm. Because we still go to the beach every year. We still do that. that. That's the investment in the things that matter the most. That's true abundance. It's investing in relationships with people that you love. Now, there are lots of psychological studies that show this, where you have a choice between a little bit of money and something fun to do. Right? And inevitably, when people choose the experience, they wind up happier. There's a lot of research on this. There's a, a, there are hundreds of studies that show this. But you don't need the studies. You know this is true in your own life. You know, I have um, three kids. Uh, they're uh, 20, 18, and 15. And my middle, my middle son, his name is Carlos, and he's, he's just turning 18 now. And he's always been kind of trouble. I mean, he's the middle child, and he's a boy, and he has a lot of energy, and he's always getting in trouble in school. He's always gotten in trouble in school. So the headmaster of the school would call, and, and he would say, you know, your son Carlos, he's selling turtles at school, or something, and it's always a big problem that doing something he's not supposed to do. So when he's nine years old, nine years ago, it's October, and he comes to me and he says, Dad, I've been thinking about Christmas. Now immediately I'm suspicious, because I know whatever it is is going to cost me a lot of money. I'm thinking about Christmas. Nothing good can come from this conversation, I figure. But I say, okay, what, what are you thinking? And he said, I've decided I don't want anything this year. I just want to go away alone with you fishing. I said, fine. And we did that, and we've done it every single year since. It's all he wants for Christmas. Every year as we go away, four days fishing between Christmas and New Year's Day. And I could, I could have bought him a bicycle or a, a, some sort of toy every year, and, and it would be broken and gone and forgotten. But I can tell you, every place we've gone, every single year, and every fish we've caught. Because it's permanently on my part. So invest, not in things, if you want true abundance without attachment, invest in people, especially the people that you love. Those are the two practices of oneness without attachment. Okay, here are my two big points that I want you to remember. Number one, we can't rebel against capitalism per se. Look, if you're on the left and you think we need more regulations about capitalism, fine. And if you're on the right and you think we need fewer regulations about capitalism, that's good too. But we all have to come together to realize that capitalism is our only hope for bringing our brothers and sisters out of poverty. It's the only way, and we actually have to make it better and use it more under democracy. But at the same time, if we don't want to lose our souls, we have to remember the principles that we share as spiritual people, which is that abundance has to come without attachment, and we are responsible to practice non-attachment within the system of abundance. If we do this, I think it's a new day. I think that we can transcend political arguments. I think that we can come together as people. I think that we can fix our political disagreements. And at the same time, we can serve the people in our society who truly need us the most while we can become happier people at the same time. And I bet you every single one of us in this room wants those two things. I'm really honored to have this ability, this opportunity to talk to you tonight. I'm honored to come to this beautiful place, my first time in Kerala, a famous place that has sent successful people all over the world. It's an honor to be here at our sister think tank here in Kerala, and, and especially to have a discussion about philosophical matters in the, the, uh, the, the cradle of the world of discussions about true philosophy here in India. God bless you, and thank you. Thank you for that offer, and I'd also like to start out by thanking Kanraj and thanking the Center for Public Policy Research 
and you know uh, those of us who have been writing about the role of markets, free markets, and the role of capitalism, and the importance of understanding it so that, so that India can continue to eradicate poverty, continue to grow wealthier. Uh, there, there are a few people who have been on the front lines of that, and I think in here, here in Kochi and in Kerala, and Raj and CPPR have really sort of done great work, so just want to say thank you for that, and thank you for hosting us. So, Arthur, before I open this up for, to the uh, audience, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Now, the first is that you pointed out the, the five reasons that poverty has been reduced by a staggering 80% since around 1970. And I bet many people in this room were not aware of that. But what it raises is an interesting question, because every day when we open the newspapers, we read about the backlash against globalization, the backlash against trade, the backlash against capitalism. So how do you explain why something that has lift, that has reduced poverty by 80% in such a short period of time gets such a bad rap? There's a phenomenon all over Europe and in the United States right now, which is right-wing populism. And right-wing populism is, is not really conservatism as we talk about it. It's not in favor of free enterprise. It's not in favor of globalization and free trade. It's against those things. Why? And, and I'll tell you in a nutshell why that is. When the world opened up, when the world globalized, when India started getting more prosperous, it didn't help every single person in every country. In my country, for example, I mean, it's it, when, when I was a little kid, there were no foreign cars. All the cars were made in Detroit. They were, they were American cars. It was General Motors and Chrysler and Ford, three car companies. And then suddenly we started getting cars from Japan. And then suddenly we started getting cars from Germany and cars from Italy and cars from, then cars from Korea. And, and who knows where all the cars were coming from? If India had industrialized at the same time, we would have gotten cars from India. Now, that's great for the citizens of Japan. The fact that Japan went from a desperately poor country that had been defeated in World War II to the, one of the richest countries in the world in 30 years is because of globalization. But at the same time, that meant that people who make cars in America lost their jobs because the market changed. That's why there's backlash periodically. It's because we don't know what to do about the people who get a little bit poorer in America. And I can't go to somebody who's making a car in Detroit and say, don't worry about losing your job, because somebody in Korea is not poor anymore. He says, I don't care. I lost my job. Huh. Give me my job back. You know how we get my job back? We close the borders. We stop the trade. We cut the globalization. Now, of course, that's impossible. That will never happen. But furthermore, it's immoral, because we, are, we have brothers and sisters in India, too, and in Africa, and places all over the world. We, we want to lift them up, and we can't lift them up through charity. We can only lift them up through enterprise. So what do we have to do? If we don't like the populism, then we have to combat it by making sure that we're taking care of our own people so that they can readjust. The answer, my friends, is education. The answer is retraining people who are displaced when jobs start to go around the world. And we've done a very poor job of that in the United States. And we're going to have the problems that we have with right-wing populism until we figure this one out. So I was in Delhi a couple of days ago. And I, took a, I had to see somebody at a ministry. And I took a car. And along the way, I was chatting with the driver. And it turns out that this driver had a very interesting life story. So he was telling, I was asking him about the economy and politics and how was the country doing. And he tells me that, you know, things in India are going really badly. My life is really not so good. So then I asked him a little bit about his life. And I said, well, how much education did you get? And he said, well, I studied until fifth grade. I said, well, do you have children? He said, yes, a boy and a girl. How much education do you think your children will have? And he said, sir, they will both go to college. Then I asked him about whether he had 
a cell phone, a refrigerator, and a television in his home. And he says, yes, I have all three. I said, did your, did your parents have these things? He said, of course not. And so then I said, objectively speaking, you know, so he would be a part of that 80%. This guy is part of your 80%. But this guy who's part of your 80% does not think his life is better. And because he doesn't think his life is better, that has tremendous consequences in a democracy. So what, what are we getting wrong? So you know, you and I, we can convince each other. Why are we not getting through to that guy? And what's the secret of getting through to that guy? In every country, people appreciate material advances to be sure, but that's not enough. That isn't enough. We're not material beings. Remember the non-attachment part that actually comes from the, the, the development of the spirit. In, in so many countries, you know, I, I, I lived in Spain for a long time, as I mentioned before, and I go to Spain all the time. People are miserable in Spain. People are much happier in India than they are in Spain. I see happy people here all the time. People smile here. People are kind to you here. In Spain, people are miserable. They treat each other poorly. And they always talk about how they don't, life isn't any good. But they're much richer than it is. Spain is a richer country than it. How does this make sense? Because it wasn't very long ago that Spain was pretty poor too. My wife grew up in poverty in Barcelona, where sometimes they had electricity and sometimes they didn't have electricity. So, so how is it that a place like Kerala can be happier than a place like Spain. How is that? Simple. Spain has a lot of material things, but Spain is missing a bunch of different institutions. There are four things that you need to be a happy person. Four, there are four accounts that you need. Faith, family, friends, and work. Those are the four things for everybody in the world that all of us need to be happy people. We need to be spiritual, and we need to have family relationships, and we need to have a community of people who care for us, and we need to have meaningful work where we can serve other people. And the problem with Spain today is that nobody goes to church, and family relationships are highly attenuated because people are not getting married, and they're not having children, and community is fragmenting because when family falls apart, people move away and fewer and fewer people work. Under 30, there's a 45% unemployment rate in Spain. Now, that doesn't mean they're starving because the government gives them what they need. But getting money from the government is not the same as earning your money. We're, we're made to earn our money, to earn our success. So this is the key thing to remember. Sure, development, I, I, I believe in development because I believe that we are built to create a world in which there isn't poverty. But we have to have more than that. And so we all need to work for the, the principles of spiritual development and family development and community development and the sanctification of work. And if we build a society on those pillars, then your taxi driver, my guess is he'll have a more fulfilling life. Well, at the same time, he has no danger of suffering from poverty. One of the things that struck me while you were giving this talk is that we're in a if you were giving this talk in, say, Western Europe, you may find it harder to explain the concept of non-attachment to your audience. But we are in a part of the world where many people will get that quite quickly and quite instinctively. But the battles we've had in India are really about the first part. We've had battles in this country over the last 70 years about the abundance part. Right? We're in a state that's ruled by a communist government. We have Piketty, who's quoted in the papers all the time. We have people who feel that even though India has done, has pulled more people out of poverty faster in the last 25 years, that at any time in its history, somehow it took the wrong turn. So there are societies where you still have to make the case for abundance before you get to abundance 
without attachment to it. So where's the case for abundance? And let's say that everyone gets the without attachment part. If you all get the without attachment part, congratulations. Because <laughs> that's a very beautiful thing. And I admire that a lot. And it is true that the, the part about abundance is easier in the West than it is here. <laughs> and, and the part about non-attachment is easier here than it is in the West. I understand that. Every, every culture has its strengths. I understand that. But the key thing to remember is if you are dedicated to your fellow men and women, then you must try to alleviate poverty. There is simply no other way. It's not good enough to say that poor people, they're close to God. They're starving. It's not right. I understand that spiritual development, I understand that, that heaven is more important than bread. I get that, right? But bread is important too. And we should be able to do both at the same time. Here, here's my, my value proposition. Here's what I'm offering. You can do both. You don't have to choose. No, 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 no. You must do both. Morally, you must work for both abundance and non-attachment. Almost everybody I talk to who complains about democratic capitalism, who says that, that free enterprise is ruining our society, that we've taken a wrong turn, they're always rich people. You ever notice this? They're always people who have abundance, who are always militating against abundance. It's so ironic. In the United States, it's college professors who come from wealthy families, who are the Marxists. It's never the poor people who started their own businesses. It's never the people who are running a little grocery store. It's not somebody who's, who, who started a, a little tiny store selling shoes. Those are never the people who are militating against capitalism. They're practicing capitalism. Think, think about this, this beautiful, beautiful city. This is, you know, when, when, if Americans come to Kochi, they say, it's not poor. Because you know what? It isn't poor. This place is amazing. 8% of, of, of people from Kerala don't live in this country. 8% live outside. They provide one-third of the GDP of Kerala. Isn't that extraordinary? 8% get 33% of the GDP of Kerala. Why? Capitalism. They're participating every single day in capitalism. They're participating in the system of abundance. And by the way, your country is sharing hard-working, talented people with the rest of the world, and that is a blessing for the rest of the world. Incredible. You know, when you see doctors and nurses in the United States, they're from Kerala, right? If you see people who rent motels, they're from Gujarat State. If you see college professors, they're from... It's funny. I mean, it, 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 India has sent all kinds of talented people to the rest of the world, but what are they practicing? They're practicing markets, and they're enriching people in their own country at the same time. Bottom line, don't choose between abundance and non-attachment. Practice both, bless the world, and lift up others. Thank you.